Well, it's nice to um, talk to all of you about uh, the passionate work that we do here at the Mind Institute and in my lab. And I'll be talking with you first about the uh, work we do in outcome measure development and tracking treatment response in individuals with Fragile X and Down syndrome, which are the two um, disorders that I'm most focused on or we are most focused on here. Um, so let me go through a few disclosures. Um, so as many of you are aware, there have been a number of uh, treatments, targeted treatments developed for Down syndrome and for, uh, and for Fragile X. And those have been put forth by several pharmaceutical companies. And my philosophy is to try to help um, these uh, initiatives to uh, develop the most uh, sensitive or use the most sensitive outcome measures uh, and design the best clinical trials. So um, I have been um, working with them and receiving support um, through UC Davis for consulting to these companies. So um, I'm going to start with the MGLUR5 theory of Fragile X because um, that's really when a pivotal change happened in our field when we had a really well-defined target for intervention for a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, and as you can see here, um, there was a lot of work done in uh, explaining uh, the neurobiology of this particular uh, aspect of Fragile X. And at that stage, we were even talking about possibly a cure for Fragile X syndrome. This model uh, is based on uh, the role of glutamate in the brain, and glutamate is a primary excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, and so the drug development focused uh, heavily on that mechanism. And as I'll describe later, there have been a number of trials um, targeting this mechanism in patients with Fragile X. Um, so we had a lot of excitement um, several years back on this mechanism. Now in Down syndrome, and I should uh, probably put a caveat out that this is a newer focus in my lab, but we're gaining a lot of experience quickly. Um, in Down syndrome, there have also been targeted treatment efforts. Um, this time, or in this case, focused on the GABA neurotransmitter system, which is the uh, neurotransmitter that's heavily involved in inhibition in the brain. And as you'll see from um, the descriptions of excitatory and in inhibitory um, in the brain, there, are, there is a balance between uh, excitation and inhibition. And so these um, treatments are designed to, well, I guess I should have muted my phone, sorry. Um, these uh, treatments are designed to uh, normalize that balance. But unfortunately, as in Fragile X, uh, in the Down syndrome uh, trial uh, put forth by Roche, uh, we also had uh, limited success. Now, a lot of these treatments uh, come through a process that we call uh, the translational research uh, cycle. So I've just kind of schematically shown this here. We have what we call the human phenotype, which is the outward manifestation of a disorder. Um, and so here we focus uh, on the family and on the patients and the difficulties that they are having in life. Fortunately for Fragile X and Down syndrome, we have um, defined the genetic basis of uh, both conditions. Uh, and I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but you can see them depicted here. And coming from that, we, we generally in the field have developed cellular measures to see how the neurons in the brain function differently in these different conditions. There are animal models that have been developed for both Fragile X and Down syndrome that have been enormously impactful in the field in terms of um, studying the phenotype, studying brain function, and so on and how um, the genetic mutation affects behavior and the way the brain functions. And then from there, uh, drugs have de been developed and screened, uh, biomarkers um, to measure treatment response. And then the focus of my talk is on outcome measures, which are 
the ways in which that we, we uh, measure the response to treatment in a trial. And so here um, you see the clinical uh, depiction of clinical trials that have been done. The question mark is an indication of some limited success we've had in both of these programs. And you can see here um, the indication that we need to go back and rethink the ways in which um, we describe the phenotype, uh, the way we model the disease. And then the green arrow here is the focus of my work, which is how do we reinvent or redefine clinical measures that can track treatment response. So we've learned a great deal from the many Fragile X trials. You can see um, them all listed here uh, in this review by uh, Dr. Barry Kravis. Um, many different drugs have been tried, um, some of them targeting the glutamate system, some the GABA system, and many others. And you can see the wide variety of behaviors or clinical problems that have been a target of the trials. And I've color coded them here to show you that most of the outcome measures have been um, provided by caregivers. So parents report on how their um, son or daughter is responding uh, during the trial. Uh, others were clinician ratings, which are also dependent on caregivers. And then uh, a smaller number have utilized direct assessments of the patients performing a task, such as a cognitive test. So um, in the field in general, not just in Fragile X, but in uh, the broader field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, the vast majority of controlled trials have used these caregiver rating scales to measure treatment response. And in our review, this is a few years old now, but um, we found that about 81% of all studies relied on caregiver report. So how is that done? Um, typically, there's a checklist where the parent considers a, a number of different behaviors that the person may show over a period of weeks, and they're asked to um, rate on a severity scale how significant those problems were during that time period. And so as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of variability in the accuracy of the reporting. Um, there are certainly biases involved. Um, and people's memories vary a lot in how uh, well they can recall what happened um, with their child during that time. And so um, in the Fragile X trials, um, we uh, have used these uh, behavioral measures quite often. And you can see here one of the challenges that we've faced. And that is that um, when we look at um, change, so from baseline or starting the trial to the beginning of treatment, uh, we see that um, there's improvements not only in the groups that have an active treatment in blue, but also in the placebo group or the group that gets a um, inactive pill um, that it does not provide the treatment. And so this um, big response that we see in the um, inactive group is called a placebo response. And that's been a big limitation that we've seen in the field overall, not just in Fragile X, but also in autism and other developmental disorders. So a key question, of course, is, does a particular treatment actually cause meaningful improvement in the person's life. And that's really what we're going for. That's the central um, question that we, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to try to answer. So how is that done? And, and I know many of you know what a random a randomized controlled trial is, but just for the um, for those of you who are less uh, informed or less knowledgeable about this, um, a randomized placebo-controlled trial is where we have a group of patients that we want to treat. We basically, in essence, flip a coin and determine whether they um, enter a treatment group where they have the active um, intervention or the control group where they usually would have a placebo or inactive, um, uh, inter or inactive pill, essentially. And um, so randomization ensures that everybody uh, is assigned uh, fairly and equally and avoids bias. Blinded means the patients and the people who are doing the testing and the researchers don't know which group the patient is in. And placebo-controlled means, of course, like I said before, they 
get the inactive um, control condition. And then we measure uh, uh, the A is assessments at each time point and compare um, improvement in the treatment group versus the control group. So assessment and outcome measures is really where the rubber meets the road. Um, we need to have good tools that um, can be sensitive to these treatments. Um, so primary endpoint is the primary measure by which the treatment is judged. We need to ensure that it's measuring something important, that it is a relevant and important um, aspect of the person's functioning in their life. It needs to be feasible, which means we need to be able to get um, a good uh, measurement from the patients when they're in the trial. It needs to be reliable, meaning that when there isn't any treatment uh, or any significant change going on in the person's life, that the measurement of that uh, behavior or that construct or that thing stays stable. And then when change really does happen, does it um, reflect that change? Does it sensitively pick it up? And then of course, we wanna have measures that are less susceptible to these placebo effects um, or biases that I mentioned before. So this is where we get to the topic of cognition. Um, of course, they are the primary defining feature of intellectual and developmental disabilities. They are certainly, um, or can be objective and can be measured reliably. And um, one big advantage is that they can be matched to the cognitive phenotype or the cognitive characteristic of a unique condition or syndrome. And many of these have been matched or associated with particular brain mechanisms that are specific to the um, syndrome. Um, and they may, therefore, they may be more sensitive to changes uh, with targeted treatment. And finally, um, in future thinking, future uh, clinical trials, we can consider that they might be enhanced not only by uh, pharmacological uh, treatments, but also through learning or um, cognitive interventions. So that's where the cognition tool, uh, toolbox battery really um, came to the forefront in my mind. This was uh, a tool that we've been heavily focused on, developed by Northwestern. Um, it's done on the iPad tablet. Um, it emphasizes executive function and it um, has a great advantage of being validated in people from age three all the way to 85 with uh, normative data from the general population. And you can see uh, the different tests that um, are part of the toolbox measuring cognitive flexibility, um, inhibitory control and attention, processing speed. We have a new speeded matching processing speed test that we've recently developed. Uh, working memory, um, uh, picture sequence memory, which looks at episodic memory, uh, 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 receptive vocabulary, and a little bit on reading and letter or word recognition. And these are depicted here. Just a couple of examples. So for cognitive flexibility, it's a test where the individual needs to match uh, one of the two pictures on the bottom with the picture on the top. And they uh, will be asked to match either by color or by shape. And they will do that for several um, items or several trials. And then the rules will change and they'll have to learn to match by the other dimension. Uh, flanker is a measure of inhibitory control and attention where the individual is making judgments about the direction of the arrow or fish in the middle and may be influ influenced by the um, incongruent or congruent direction of the flanking fish on the left and the right. Uh, picture sequence memory, as I mentioned before, an episodic memory test where the person learns a story sequence and then those images that depict the story are mixed up and they have to place the images back in the sequence that they've seen and heard. Um, so for our grant, um, we have um, support from the NICHD, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And in our first five years of work, we really focused on three big aims. One was to validate these uh, measures to determine how reliable and um, representative they are and feasible for uh, people with intellectual disabilities. To look at how sensitive they are, not 
in this particular phase of the um, project, not to treatment, but sensitive to developmental change. So we have done a longitudinal study where we um, assess people with fragile X and Down syndrome and other intellectual disabilities at one point in time, and then two years later they return, and we look to see if the measures are detecting the expected cognitive growth that we would see at different ages. Um, I guess that's the third one, sorry. <laughs> um, the second one, uh, I had them reversed. The second one is to detect um, clinically meaningful differences. So knowing a little bit about what the cognitive phenotype is of fragile X or Down syndrome or autism from prior work, can we um, detect those expected differences in these tests? So our work has been uh, largely focused on about, uh, about, we're up to about 250, 260 individuals now, but at the time we published this work, 242 uh, individuals with fragile X and Down syndrome and a mixed group of other intellectual disabilities. There's a lot on this slide, but I'd say you can focus on the bottom here uh, where it describes the chronological ages um, in the teens with a range of six to 25, uh, mental age, um, usually around, um, uh, four, five, six. Um, the IQs you can see described here at the bottom in the 50s to 60s on average. Um, and so that gives you a sense of who, who we have in our study. Feasibility, as I mentioned before, is a very important thing. We want to make sure we can actually do the test with um, a large proportion of patients. And you can see here the measures on the left and mental age shown here up on the top. Um, you can see that um, we do really well um, with a mental age of five or higher, pretty well with a mental age of four, and then um, a bit more spotty in uh, the range of three to four. And one of the um, real big uh, points of emphasis for our new work uh, that's beginning now is um, improving the feasibility for not only um, those in the three to four range, but also developing new tests in collaboration with Northwestern for even um, individuals who have lower mental ages or who are much younger. So for reliability or making sure that, or determining whether a measure is sensitive, is um, stable over time, we use something called an intra-class uh, coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient. So the closer this number is to one, the, close, the, the more reliable or stable the measure is. And you can see here that we do quite well with most of the toolbox measures and the composites, um, our uh, stability me uh, metrics are really quite good. Um, Cohen's D here tells us, is there a significant change from a baseline assessment to a follow-up that's just four weeks later? And you can see that there's quite good stability and that most of the tests don't show significant change. A little bit of a significant improvement in performance on retesting with Flanker, uh, quite a bit more with pattern comparison, so they may get a little bit quicker on their responses. Um, but these effect sizes are relatively modest or, or very small, which is a good thing. The profile um, is a really interesting um, uh, aspect of our work, the cognitive profiles. Um, a lot of this work has been done by Rebecca uh, Shields, who you can see here. She's the uh, post, I'm sorry, the graduate student that's been uh, working so hard in our lab over the years, um, coordinating the project and doing the analyses. And you can see uh, from Rebecca's analyses here that uh, the executive function tests are really the weak areas in all three groups with Fragile X being the most impacted. Um, some relative strengths in uh, episodic memory here in all the groups, uh, a relative weakness uh, as we expected to see in uh, language for individuals with Down syndrome. So these scores are all um, well below the mean in the general population, which is zero. The cognitive 
the toolbox composite score, which is a uh, amalgamation of all the tests, correlates very strongly with uh, the Stanford Binet full scale IQ, uh, which tells us that um, the battery overall is tapping um, general cognition quite well. And these are the most exciting uh, recent results to come out of our work. Uh, Rebecca has just finished this. So I know she's probably a little anxious about me presenting it, but she does such a great job that I feel comfortable sharing it with you. Um, we're getting ready to submit this now. Um, and what I just wanna point out, you know, don't, don't worry too much about all these numbers, but when we look at two-year developmental changes at different time or different age points, so at age 10 overall in our samples or 16 or 22, you can see across all these different tests from the toolbox and the Stanford Binet here at the bottom that in uh, the individuals with Down syndrome, there is significant improvement um, in many of the tests at age 10 and 16, and even um, a couple of the measures as late as age 22. So um, we can be sure that these uh, measures, these tools are detecting change over time. And many of the changes are um, as good as or uh, more significant than what we get from the Stanford Binet, um, what we call change sensitive score. Now in Fragile X, the story is very different. Um, so it's been known that there's a plateauing of cognitive development in Fragile X throughout childhood. Um, that was based a lot on IQ scores, but here with non-age adjusted scores um, from the toolbox, we can see compared to Down syndrome, there's less growth. Um, certainly at age 10, we see improvement in um, dimensional change card sort and picture vocabulary and then on the Stanford Binet but much, much less change than what we see in Down syndrome. So um, this is important information, uh, not only for describing Fragile X cognitive development, but also for um, having a um, history, a, a natural history of Fragile X so that we can determine whether treatments, which may be given over a matter of years, um, deviate in a positive way from, from these um, rather flat or flatter trajectories. And here you can see some of the graphs um, that were generated from the models. So here's kind of how it looks with the Stanford Binet uh, change sensitive scores with an evening out um, as you might expect during um, the teenage and early adult years and more uh, significant growth early on. And then here I've put the Stanford Binet uh, growth pattern um, up in the right and some of the toolbox tests to show you that um, there is not a uniform uh, pattern of growth across different cognitive constructs. It differs by construct and it also differs by the specific uh, uh, cause of intellectual disability. And this is a, an interesting uh, result and we're still working on uh, in interpreting them. But um, you can see here, for example, that the Down syndrome group has a much flatter profile on a test of cognitive flexibility than the other two. Um, and uh, the flanker test isn't here, but I, I know that the uh, Fragile X group also showed a, a flatter profile, but on a different test. So um, some really interesting new findings there on developmental change. The very most exciting news um, is that the toolbox was utilized in a recent a recently published um, study uh, carried out by Dr. Barry Kravis and her colleagues uh, with a medication developed through Tetra or with the com uh, pharmaceutical company Tetra. You can see some of the details here um, about the trial, but what I want to point out is that the toolbox actually detected improvements in the uh, active uh, treatment group compared to placebo or inactive group uh, on all, uh, on both of the language measures and on the uh, crystallized composite score. Um, now, some of the, the improvement has to do with um, improvements in the treatment group, but as you can see here, the placebo group for reasons that we don't know yet actually had a little bit of a decline. Um, and so uh, I think with the larger study that's planned, we'll learn more about 
um, the true robustness of this, um, this finding. But a positive thing here is that you can see when the placebo group switched to active uh, drug, they improved on the composite score. Um, so this is really, really exciting news. It's the first time that any targeted treatment has shown improvement in cognition in Fragile X and possibly um, other neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, I'll show you a little bit more about the, the press that's uh, coming out with that study in a minute. Oh, not in a minute, right now. Um, so I just finally got a chance to listen to this um, shortwave broadcast from NPR about targeted treatment in Fragile X. And I would encourage you to listen to this um, story because it gives you kind of a better layperson's um, sense of the history of targeted treatment in Fragile X and what the promise is or may be for this new um, intervention. We've developed some new tests, um, one called Speeded Matching that our collaborator at Northwestern, Aaron, has been working so hard on. Um, and instead of um, choosing between two images that are either the same or different. We have a matching task um, that you can see here that has performed quite well. This is under review. Um, we're having a lot of fun, uh, uh, this uh, small group, um, myself, uh, Aaron, Lauren Schmidt uh, at Cincinnati, and uh, Andy Dacopoulos, who's the new postdoc on the project, developing a new test um, called Go Fetch, which is gonna be a measure of inhibition involving um, a boy or girl uh, playing fetch with different animals where uh, they'll be throwing the ball for the dog to fetch, uh, but not uh, pressing to have it <laughs> play fetch with any of the other animals. Um, so we'll see how that performs down the road. Uh, the Northwestern group um, has a big contract to develop the NIH baby toolbox. Uh, which is going to be uh, a battery of tests for much younger children um, in the age range of one to 42 months. So this is in development now and is a uh, really an exciting avenue for us because we think that some of these measures will be quite useful in um, measuring uh, cognition and change in cognition in individuals who have mental ages in you know, the three or two or possibly even down to um, one to two year range. Um, so that's a very exciting development and is part of the new um, revision of our uh, NIH grant um, to work in some of these baby toolbox uh, measures to the project. So I'm gonna stop there and just show you all the collaborators that we've had over the years on this uh, project. Um, here at UC Davis, many uh, have worked on this over the years. Keith Wideman has been a big uh, source of uh, psychometric support uh, and analysis from UC Riverside. Uh, the whole Northwestern team uh, who's developed the toolbox. Lizberry Cravis, who I mentioned before, is the PI at Rush. Karen Riley's team at Denver. Um, the new site for our study is with Craig Erickson's team at Cincinnati Children's. And even uh, NIH, uh, Audrey Thurm's group um, has been working for some time collecting uh, toolbox data from individuals with Williams syndrome. So they'll be adding more data to the project. Well, thank you, David. It's nice to follow David, who's has such a really rich and I think really thoughtful approach to development of outcome measures. And so uh, I'd like to kind of switch a little bit and talk about our work on the language outcome measures. And, uh, here are some of the funding sources uh, for our research uh, that we've been involved in. Um, and so just I want to just start with uh, why language is an outcome measure. And I, I would hope in some respects it's it's obvious. I mean language, if we can if we can change language, if we can improve language in individuals with Down syndrome or fragile X or other neurodevelopmental challenges, uh, those are really meaningful changes. If you think about kind of, day-to-day -day life and how involved language is in everything we do from learning to social interaction, if we can change language, we can really improve quality of life. And so we focused on trying to develop uh, uh, measures that are sensitive to change in, in language. And that's what I'll focus on uh, for the rest of the talk today. Um, and so we have focused on something called expressive language sampling or ELS. 
uh, as a source of outcome measures. And we certainly did not invent this. This is really an approach to language assessment that has a really a long history of use in clinical context as well as in research. And it's used to both describe development uh, as well as challenges in spoken language. And the basic idea is very simple. If you collect a very brief sample of spoken language uh, from a child or an in individual uh, with an intellectual or developmental disabilities in a naturalistic context, uh, therefore you have kind of a representative sample of their behavior, of their language behavior. And you, we can transcribe that and analyze that sample along various dimensions. So we can learn something about their capacities in the area of vocabulary or grammar or articulation, pragmatics or the social uses of language and so on. And so we can make inferences about the speaker's language abilities basically from an analysis of a relatively brief sample of kind of naturalistic uh, language. And people have used a number of different uh, contexts uh, in which to kind of collect these language samples, both uh, clinically uh, as well as uh, in terms of research. Everything from free play with a parent, which is probably the most commonly used for young children, to structured play with an examiner, conversation with peers, storytelling or narration, picture description, and certainly even within uh, um, diagnostic devices where there are kind of probes for particular types of communicative interaction. Uh, as well. And so uh, one of the reasons that we focused on, on expressive language sampling as an outcome measure is that it has a number of potential advantages relative to standardized language tests. Um, first of all, it's uh, simple to collect. Uh, as I've mentioned, you don't need a whole lot of training uh, or a whole lot of complicated procedures um, uh, to administer. Um, there are limited floor effects uh, for these uh, measures uh, that you derive from expressive language sampling, which is really a serious problem in a lot of the standardized measures that are available, both language and cognitive measures, where they've been standardized on, a gen on the general population so that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities often uh, pretty much uh, uh, in terms of standard scores are at the floor. Uh, and that's a real problem. And David and some of his other work has really kind of led the way in addressing that. Um, the expressive language sampling procedures in one way or another can be used with children and adults. So you have kind of at least some continuity of measurement approach across a really wide age range. Um, the samples may be very brief, which is really good in a treatment study so that you're not adding burden to the research protocol. Um, you can uh, really have numerous dependent measures from a single language sample. Again, you could focus on vocabulary, articulation, uh, planning processes, syntax, um, a talkativeness, and a whole host of things. And in general, non-compliance rates are really low because the task demands are generally quite low. It's more familiar to the individual. Uh, they tend to be more play-like play and, and so on. And then lastly, and I think this is one of the real limitations of a lot of standardized measures uh, and a, a strength, the potential strength of expressive language sampling is that performance is generalizable to real world context because these really are real world contexts. You, you try and capture these samples in interactions that are, are real speaking interactions, things that happen every day. Um, and so again, these have been used for a very long time and in the field of developmental disabilities have been used for a long time. Uh, but we in the kind of late, mid to late nineties and, and beyond, we have, were really kind of concerned with how um, expressive language sampling was used uh, to study and uh, look at change within individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it was largely because there was kind of this total um, uh, lack of consideration or care about the context in which the samples were collected. Oftentimes, the samples would be collected within the same study in very different ways across participants and the data would just be concatenated as though it didn't matter um, or this, the context weren't very well described. And the reason that that was important is that there was research coming out from our lab and as well as from others that the representativeness um, of these interactions of the language samples and the nature of the language samples would be greatly affected uh, by the materials used, the partner behavior and the task. And so you really had to attend uh, to the context. And so that's really been our contribution to this is, is to really think about um, how we create these contexts in ways that um, are rigorous and still naturalistic and make them suitable for studying change. Um, and so basically what we've argued is that you really need to standardize the sampling procedures while at the same time keeping the context naturalistic. So you don't wanna go so standardized that you lose the advantage of, 
expressive language over, over some uh, norm-based standardized tests. Um, at the same time, you need to minimize the examiner's influence. And just as one kind of trivial example, um, you know, for, for if you've ever observed someone who's not used to interacting with kids, interact with a really young child, um, and they have to kind of keep them engaged, what you'll find is that they'll do things like, do you like this one? Is this one red? What's your name? What's your sister's name? And if you do all of those kinds of questions, what you're going to do, what you're going to conclude is that that poor child is at the one word stage of development, right? Because everything that you've done is really encouraged just one word at a time. And so it really is more about your behavior as the interact and then it tells you about the child's behavior. And so we really need to think about the examiner's influence as well. And then lastly, no one context is perfect for every aspect of language. And so you really need to have multiple contexts to get a comprehensive picture of, of where an individual is in terms of their language skills. And therefore uh, you need multiple contexts to look at change. And so we uh, were able to get funded through uh, an outcome measures grant from the uh, NIH a few years ago, the Expressive Language Sampling Consortium Project. And this really had two purposes. The first was to look at the psychometric properties of measures derived from these more standardized approaches to uh, expressive language sampling and to do so for uh, three populations, those with Down syndrome, Fragile X syndrome, and Autism Spectrum Disorder. And then these are the sorts of things we looked at. Feasibility, which David did such a nice job of talking about and has really kind of set the standard for the field and thinking about the importance of feasibility. We've looked at practice effects, test retest reliability, construct validity, uh, internal consistency, sensitivity to change, and floor and ceilings. And I won't talk about all of these today. I'm really going to focus on where we've kind of started, which is feasibility, practice effects, test retest, reliability, and uh, construct validity. And then lastly, we also wanted to evaluate differences in psychometric properties of these measures as a function of participant characteristics. We thought it was really important to know, for example, if uh, for a measure that you're thinking about for treatment study of individuals with Fragile X syndrome, does, th does that measure have good test retest reliability um, all the way across the age range you're interested in? If it doesn't, then you need to think, rethink the measure or you need to rethink uh, your inclusion exclusion criteria. And so here are the seven uh, universities that were involved in the consortium project. We are originally, uh, there really originally were five that were funded. It was UC Davis, Arizona, Rush, Emory, and the University of Wisconsin. And that was to do uh, collect data on Fragile X syndrome and Down syndrome. And then we were able to get a, a competitive administrative supplement to add University of Washington and the University of Minnesota to um, uh, add data collection on individuals with on the autism spectrum. Um, and uh, those, so that was a more recent uh, set of data collection. I'm really not going to have anything to say about the autism data today because we're still analyzing that. Um, and so we, uh, across the project, uh, we've looked at uh, three different contexts. We've looked at conversation, which is our kind of um, standardized approach to conversation, which is really um, uh, it's standardized in the sense of we have a set a set list of topics and a set order to introduce them. We introduce them with scripted prompts and we have scripted follow-ups, uh, but we do it in a way that makes it relatively naturalistic, uh, but really trying to minimize the examiner's contribution and really boost the uh, child or the individuals with development disabilities contribution. And it only takes about 12 minutes to administer. We do a narration task, which is really uh, the telling the story of a wordless picture book. So it's not reading, but it's using the, uh, the picture book is the, as kind of the structure for telling the story. And again, it's very scripted with prompts uh, and it takes about 15 minutes to administer. And then we're looking at the ADOS, uh, which has been suggested as, a, as given that in the area of autism, this is often administered for diagnostic purposes. Um, can you also use it as a measure of, of expressive language? Um, and uh, again, that's a longer duration. And so I'm not gonna really talk about the ADOS today because of uh, we're not quite as far along in those data. And I'll really focus on conversation and narration. Um, and we, there are a number of measures we're looking at, but these are kind of the five basic ones that we thought were really important because collectively they provide kind of a, a nice comprehensive look uh, in terms of having different dimensions of language uh, measured. Uh, talkativeness, which is just the number of utterances uh, attempted per minute, which is an, a very rough indicator of pragmatics or social skill, the ability to engage and talk, if you will. Unintelligibility, which is the proportion of utterances that are 
partly or completely unintelligible, and it's an, a, a gross indicator of articulation problems. Uh, disfluency, which is just the proportion of utterances that have false starts or repetitions or field pauses like ums and errs, uh, and it's a, a measure largely of planning. Uh, lexical diversity, which is a number of different word roots, which is a measure of vocabulary growth, and then uh, our measure of syntax, which is just mean length of utterance in morphemes, which is the morphemes are the smallest uh, linguistic units of meaning. And just to, as one example, the word cat is one morpheme, the word cats is two morphemes because adding the plural uh, changes the meaning. Um, and so it's a rough indicator of combinatorial syntax. Um, we also had for each measure, we looked to see if it was correlated with a standardized measure uh, uh, as a way of trying to validate or to show construct validity, that it's measuring what it's supposed to measure. And so for talkativeness, we use the expressive communication uh, subdomain from the Vineland uh, adaptive behavior scales. Uh, for unintelligibility, we use the goldman Fristow test of articulation, which is really a single word um, uh, repeating test and you measure the number of sounds that are produced correctly. Uh, for disfluency, which was our planning measure, we use the Stanford Binet uh, five verbal working memory subtest. For lexical diversity, we used uh, the expressive vocabulary subtest off the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals, fourth edition. And then for syntax, uh, formulated sentences. Um, and again, the idea which each, each of these is that if, if these measure what we think they measure, they should correlate with the standardized test. I will say that this is one of the challenges uh, for determining construct validity um, in our area, because uh, if you think about it, what we've argued is these are not very good measures for measuring language, yet we have to validate our measures against them. And so there, there are, uh, this is only one route for construct validity. I think David's uh, data on showing that you get the expected uh, difference in terms of phenotypic uh, profiles across your measures across different conditions is another way to do that. And we've done that as well, although I won't show you those data today. Um, and so in terms of design, we've tested uh, about 290 uh, participants that are ages six to 23 years of age um, across our three um, conditions. Um, and we broke people into these age bins of six to 11, 12 to 17 and 18 to 23 years. Uh, we had hoped to get equal numbers in each thing. We did much better with our 12 to 17 year old, uh, fewer in the six to 11 and a reasonable number of the 18 to 23 year olds. Um, and then what we did is there's an initial visit and then four, four weeks later, there's a retest visit. So we administer the expressive language sampling measures again. And that gives us our ability to assess both practice effects over the short term, as well as test retest reliability, which David talked about. And then we did a longitudinal follow-up for exactly the same reason David uh, did uh, to look at change and then to compare kind of the, the effect size in terms of change for our measures versus the standardized measures. And we did it at two years for our uh, individuals, individuals with Down syndrome and Fragile X uh, and at one year for our individuals with autism because they were less um, um, impaired overall. And so we felt we would see change over one year. Um, I, we're still analyzing the longitudinal data, so I'm going to focus largely on the initial tests and the retest data today. Um, and just to give you a sense of our conversation and narration procedures, again, a conversation, we introduce you know, a, a standard set of topics, and we do it in a relatively scripted way. So what did you do after school yesterday? Tell me everything you did. And we do it in ways where our questions are designed to elicit more open-ended and not just single word responses, uh, and then some possible follow-ups. Uh, we've used the Frog books, which are really nice books from Mercer Mayer that have been used a lot in child language research. And, and what's nice about them is that they um, are engaging across a wide age range and they can elicit stories that are very concrete about what's happening in terms of actions, or they can elicit things like character reactions and motivations and psychological states. And so they really work across a very wide age range. Um, and I'm just going to briefly show you a snippet. But the real thing to notice with both of our procedures is that we have there's really minimal participation from the examiner, and that means there's minimal scaffolding. So this is really not trying to elicit kind of the best performance with lots of prompts and, and encouragement. This is really just designed to see largely what the child can do with very minimal prompting. And so this is the conversation, and you'll get a sense of that. I was talking to your mom and she told me that you love Netflix. 
love Netflix. I love Mommy and Grandma. And the prison. Mm -hmm. I love Mom, Daddy, Dorothy and Paige, Penny, Jeff, and Pam. Mm -hmm. Who are those people? The family. Tell me. So as you can see, we're trying to limit our uh, participation by being really engaged and interested to keep the child talking. Uh, in narration here, you can see the, again, it's, re it's really minimal uh, input from us other than to get the child going and then just to encourage the child to keep talking. The next page. Well, what could I look at? And the book mouth and read Here's the next page. Happily. Okay, so they're not very difficult procedures to learn other than to kind of get there. There are constraints on timing when you prompt, when you don't prompt, and how you prompt on both of those. Uh, here are the inclusion exclusion criteria, the main inclusion exclusion criteria. Everyone met criteria for intellectual disability with IQs of less than or equal to 70. Speech was the primary means of communication. They had to have at least some multi-word utterances, which I think is important in terms of the generalizability of our findings. Uh, because we were doing this only in English at this point, primary language is English, which is a limitation of our, of our measures, but I'll return to that at the end. And then there had to be unstable treatment, either kind of their educational or behavioral treatment or their pharmacological treatment right before the assessment, uh, whether it was test, retest, or the longitudinal follow-up. Uh, the average age was uh, around 15, but again, from about six to 23. Um, uh, these are the deviation IQs, which one, is one of the innovations that David made. And so there was really a wide age of, uh, range of effectiveness um, when you use the deviation IQs. Um, um, about 20% were uh, Hispanic or Latinx. Uh, about half males, and then you can see it was a largely a white uh, population, although there was some diversity, but that's also a limitation uh, of our sample as well. Um, so this is in terms of feasibility. This is a study of all of the data that I'm going to present um, on the down, I'm going to focus largely on Down syndrome, and I'll just kind of tell you what the Fragile X data showed. This has come from a recent study that uh, Dr. Angie Thurman has led, and she's really been the key uh, collaborator in all of this work. In fact, she's the key collaborator in everything out of our lab, without a doubt. Um, and these are just different ways of thinking about feasibility in terms of um, whether the individual was meaningfully engaged in the task so that you can kind of quote unquote trust that you've learned something real about their behavior. Um, and um, we, in terms of, we, and we did the same thing for conversation or, or narration. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but basically we judged either the examiner made a judgment or the transcriber as they're transcribing the sample judge where, whether the individual was compliant, whether they were really, you know, trying to participate in a task where they were trying to avoid the task and those sorts of things. Um, and you can see and defined in that way, a relatively low uh, proportion were non-compliant, both at tests and retests and conversation, somewhat higher in narration. And again, these are all down our data from on individuals with Down syndrome, uh, but still a less than 15%. And then these other ways of thinking about kind of engagement really had to do with, well, how long uh, in terms of the number of utterances, uh, um, what, how long in terms of the duration of the sample, or how many pages they said something meaningful about in the book. Um, but we really use this as kind of our major measure to say that the, you know, most, of, most of the folks were meaningfully engaged. Um, and then in all of the data I'll show you on the psychometrics, it includes only those that were compliant on both the test and retest for each of these measures. And again, I'm only gonna show you the Down syndrome data uh, at this point. So in terms of feasibility, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, less mature participants were more likely to be non-compliant. And that was true if you looked at age, uh, younger kids were uh, less likely, uh, younger individuals with Down syndrome were less likely to be compliant than older, uh, lower IQs, um, um, if they had um, um, kind of an, an ADOS mod, one of the earlier ADOS modules, so they had less language, they were more likely to be uh, non-compliant. And the reason I think this is important is when we have these kinds of data, then people making a determination for a, a treatment study, 
they can make decisions about um, what their inclusion and exclusion criteria are if they're going to use this this particular measure or whether the measure is appropriate. So they can play around with some combination of the age, the IQ, and uh, language level level or um, ADOS module as a way of trying to figure out how to put together a study where, where this is really the right measure relative to their sample. And just as kind of a more concrete uh, example, um, if we look at a, a group that's under 12 years of age, has uh, mental ages on the uh, Stanford Binet of uh, less than uh, four and three quarters and got an, uh, an ADOS module of one or two, um, they were uh, relatively non-compliant, right? So the 38% were compliant, non-compliant in conversation, 75% were non-compliant in narration. However, if you create a different combination, let's say um, 12 years or older, um, four and three quarters uh, mental age or higher, module three or higher, um, all of a sudden you had like really great compliance. And so again, by looking at different combinations of these and thinking about your sample relative to the, the feasibility of the measure, uh, you're gonna increase the likelihood that this is the right uh, measure for your population in a treatment study. Um, and so in terms of practice effects, obviously I'm not gonna have time to go through all of these in, in detail. Um, let me just say, when we looked at kind of the test retest, whether there were changes over time, we saw only one significant change, but that did not uh, did not remain significant after we cor corrected for multiple comparisons. And all of the effect sizes were very small, so there really were no practice effects for individuals with Down syndrome on in either conversation or narration over a four week window. Um, when we look at the correlations between the two administrations, between tests and retests, we looked at simple bivariate correlations and then interclass correlations that David introduced to you last time. Um, they were all highly significant um, and they all withstood correction for multiple comparisons. And so the really very, very strong test retest uh, reliability for um, all five measures uh, in conversation and narration for individuals with Down syndrome. Um, if we look at construct validity, so in terms of convergent validity, we're looking at the diagonal. And what we see is that for the uh, lexical diversity measure, it correlates highly with what the, the expressive vocabulary standardized test syntax correlates highly with the, with the measure it was matched to. The um, talk of this did not. Um, intelligibility correlated with its external validation measure and disfluency did not. Um, and so this is a, a pattern we see over and over again across all of our populations and our measures that I'll show you in a second is that um, lexical diversity syntax and unintelligibility, uh, we have good evidence of construct validity. And I, I put the off diagonals um, because it, we've had a challenge in thinking about what, how to think about the discriminant validity. Um, and all of these different dimensions of language are highly intercorrelated as you can see here um, by these correlations. And so, um, this is certainly the case that this, is, this lexical diversity measure is not just a measure of vocabulary or syntax, it's not just a measure of syntax. These are measures of language that have kind of an emphasis on these particular things, but these are certainly not discriminant in the sense of being that strongly tied to a specific, specific dimension of language. Um, the same sort of pattern in, for narration, again, lexical diversity, syntax, and uh, the unintelligibility measure, we see good convergent validity. And then here's a different way of thinking about uh, the discriminant validity. Uh, we looked at whether these measures from the expressive language sampling, again, for our Down syndrome population, were uh, correlated with things that we see as more distant. So these aren't language-based measures. Um, the uh, autism, I'm sorry, the aberrant behavior checklist, total scores, and then the Vineland uh, maladaptive behavior scores. And what you can see is that all of the correlations are quite low. This one was significant at P.05, but did not withstand a correction. So basically none of these were correlated. So there is some evidence of, of kind of discriminant validity. When we looked at our fragile X sample, and again, just because I don't have time to go into it, uh, in terms of non-compliance rates, we saw very similar to what we saw with uh, our participants with Down syndrome. Um, and similar sorts of relationship to the kind of degree of developmental challenge, younger and uh, kind of less developmentally advanced um, had, were more likely to be non-compliant. 
Um, we also looked, uh, and this we didn't do with our Down syndrome sample, we, we kind of looked at the psychometrics separately for each of our three age groups. The challenge here is when we included only those that participants that were compliant, uh, there were only like, you know, I think 18 or 19 in this group. So it's hard to evaluate the youngest group, but uh, nonetheless, we saw no practice effects at any, in any age group. Uh, some less consistency in test, re test reliability for the youngest group, but not bad. Uh, no evidence of convergent uh, validity for the youngest group. Uh, and everything was in the right direction, but they're just the sample size was too small, so we need to do more work there. When we looked at stratifying by kind of a, the median IQ, there was no difference in any of the psychometrics as a function of IQ. So the low and high groups, uh, we saw the same. Uh, so good, you know, minimal practice effects, strong test re retest reliability and evidence of construct validity for those three measures. Um, when we stratified by ADOS to severity score to look at those with fewer and more um, uh, symptoms of autism, there was not much difference, uh, a little bit more practice effects, uh, a little bit of practice effects for the low severity group, but only on disfluency and a tendency for the convergent validity uh, um, correlations to be a little bit lesser in magnitude, but very similar. And so really it was only age that really seemed to matter uh, and not so much of these in terms of the psychometrics. Um, a different data set, and I just want to mention this briefly, um, is that we also, in, a, in another study, we're looking at some of the determinants of independent functioning in adults with uh, fragile X syndrome. And um, you know, one of the things that we think is important that if these are really important outcome measures and you change them in a treatment study, these should be measures that, have, that bear some resemblance or have some impact on real world functioning. And so what we see here is these are correlations from just our, narr our narration measures for adults with fragile X syndrome, our lexical diversity syntax and unintelligibility measure with different measures of independence in adulthood. So the Wasteman uh, activities of daily living, three subdomains from socialization on the Vineland, uh, social participation index, index and a self-determination scale. And we see really nice correlations. Uh, and so the, the better ones, the, uh, vocabulary, expressive vocabulary, expressive syntax, and uh, the lower ones in, uh, in intelligibility problems, the, the more likely you are to score higher on these measures of independence. And so we think that's important. And then lastly, um, uh, this is another project with Marie Chanel, uh, who is a former postdoc, now a faculty member at University of Illinois. And we looked at typically developing a large sample of typically developing individuals from about age four uh, into their early 20s. Um, and look, just wanted to look at you know, cross-sectional trajectories to see what the kind of the developmental ceiling was on these measures. And this is just for our lexical diversity measure. And it really continues to increase pretty well up until age 17 uh, or so uh, for typically developing individuals. So there's a really high ceiling uh, when we use these wordless picture books in terms of lexical diversity. We saw the same thing with syntax as well. And so I think that's really important because we don't wanna have measures that have such a low ceiling, it's hard to get improvement. So clearly there's a lot of room for improvement on these measures. Um, so just in terms of a summary, and then I wanna end really quickly with uh, just one more point, and then we'll open up for questions is that um, uh, these measures are really feasible for individuals with Down syndrome or Fragile X, um, although we need to be uh, mindful of the fact that uh, we have higher rates of compliance for older and more developmentally advanced individuals, uh, minimal practice effects, uh, excellent test-free test reliability, evidence of construct validity for at least three of the measures that we've derived from our expressive language sampling, some evidence of discriminant validity, uh, at least in the sense of language versus non-language. Uh, stronger psychometrics for older, more developmentally advanced. Uh, this, some evidence that these are uh, related to functioning in real world context. And then there's adequate ceiling for at least some of the, the measures. Uh, and so then the, uh, in terms of the next step, we, obviously we still have a lot of data to analyze. And, and two things that I wanna mention that I think are really important in terms of our limitations currently. The, so the real limitation of going to scale with expressive language sampling is right now, everything is transcribed essentially by hand. Um, and largely this is because for children, it's re, you know, these speech recognition programs don't do a very good job, particularly if there are articulation problems. And so it's really time consuming anywhere from three to five hours on these samples. And so we're looking at ways of trying to at least partially um, automate transcription and coding. And I think that will really be important for going to scale. And then, as I mentioned right now, everything is done in English. We have just 
uh, completed a study, uh, Laura Del Hoyo Soriano is a postdoc in our lab, um, has uh, developed a way of training parents to fidelity and administration and has done that for Spanish speaking and English speaking uh, families. We think that's really important because until we have more measures for uh, other languages, we're really excluding from potential benefit and participation in these treatment studies, a really large segment of our population. I think that's a really ethical problem we need to address. And then lastly, I just wanna mention uh, outcome measures in clinical trial design, because these things are not separate things. Um, most of the drugs, and David did a great job of talking about this, most of the drugs kind of have these potential for broad and nonspecific effects on brain and behavior, because they're really targeting really broad uh, neurotransmitter systems, right? And that makes it difficult to know what outcome measure to select, particularly when, the, according to the FDA, you need one primary outcome measure. And if you pick the wrong outcome measure, then you know, you're really in trouble and, and may conclude the drug doesn't work. And when it's just that you didn't quite know how to pick your measure. And so we've argued for a variety of reasons that we shouldn't just do drug studies, that we should always pair a drug with a behavioral intervention along with the drug. And there are a couple of reasons for that. I think it avoids the ethical and logistic issues raised with a no treatment placebo. I think it also potentially boosts the effects of the drug, because if you think of the drug as only really priming the neural network to, to be a better learning mechanism, you, you, know, you need to enrich learning experiences maybe to see that in a short-term study. And so really pairing it with a powerful behavioral intervention makes sense. And then lastly, um, if you pair it with a behavioral intervention, then you're channeling the benefits of the drug so you know how to choose on a in a rational way your outcome measure. So for example, we have paired drugs with language interventions. And so then it makes sense if we're gonna see an effect, uh, effect of the drug anywhere, it should be on language. And so we would select a language outcome measure, not a memory outcome measure, or not an anxiety outcome measure. And so I think that we need to really rethink clinical trial design as well as our outcome measures. And I'm just gonna stop there uh, and just, uh, we've been really fortunate to be funded by a number of different agencies. We've had a number of great uh, colleagues over the years working on this and uh, colleagues in the consortium, and obviously uh, Angie Thurman, who none of this would be possible without her. And then obviously the you know, hundreds of families uh, who have been so generous with their time to make even this little bit of our, our research possible. One question that we have is that uh, you both uh, spoke about how you've been looking at the different measures in different populations. So for those who are considering using measures like these in groups that you haven't studied yet, how do you think the um, extension to other diagnostic groups uh, that haven't been looked at, how should that proceed? Do we need to do this separately for everyone? Do we have insight from what we've learned to try to sort of streamline our future areas? So I was wondering if you both could sort of separately speak about that. Yeah, um, I'll just mention one thing and I'm sure David has some thoughts about this as well. Yeah, I think it's not practical to like do these large psychometric studies on every single condition, right? It just, it doesn't make sense. Um, but I do think if we do it across enough conditions that differ in interesting ways, we'll get a better handle on what are the factors that are important. So even in our lab, uh, obviously we've seen that, um, you know, some of the same factors affect compliance and affect uh, kind of the, the psychometrics as well. And so I, I think we're learning something about kind of the common denominators. And so I think we'll be able to extend that, especially when we finish our, uh, our data on our sample of individuals on the autism spectrum, because it's a wider IQ range, for example. And I think we'll have a better feel for it. Uh, and so I think then it just becomes a matter of selecting um, a treatment measure based on the particular phenotype and profile of the condition under study and how it resembles or, or differs from these conditions that where we really have the psychometric data. Yeah, I, I mostly agree with what Len said. I guess the only caveat would be in terms of using these measures in a treatment study as a primary or an important outcome measure, um, it is important to recognize that some of the psychometrics can vary across conditions. So like, for example, in our studies with the toolbox, um, some of the executive function tests were very reliable in Fragile X, but not in Down syndrome and vice versa. So if you were to design a study where you were looking at you know, one of these tests in another population, you may not know ahead of time how reliable 
that measure is in the specific condition that you're treating. So it's a little tricky because we'd like to be able to say, you know, good to go kind of thing. If um, I think certainly if it's a higher functioning population with less confounds during testing, you probably can feel safer that it it'll perform well if the psychometrics look really good in a more difficult population to test. But it's always better to have the measures on the population of interest before using it in that way. I don't know. That's just my my feeling. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Another question we have is, how did you choose the different validation measures, the skills or assessments you used? And have you thought about other measures um, to use in comparison? So one example for you, David, was the cognitive assessment system or other cognitive tools to use in comparison. Yeah. That was really tough for us um, making those decisions. Um, you know, of course, you want to try to choose a measure that's also feasible, that um, is on face value and, and from prior studies is measuring the same construct or close to it. But there often are multiple choices within that area. And then it's kind of like, well, which one? Um, and you know, I think feasibility is probably what helped us choose um, and prior literature, you know, seeing that it performed okay in the population. Um, but I've made this point in some of the, in some of the papers I've published that in people with intellectual disabilities who um, have a mental age that's much younger, what we see is a, can be a lack of discrimination between different constructs where you know you think that mainly what you're measuring is working memory and you would think that that would correlate with another working memory test and not correlate with something else let's say but what we see in low functioning lower functioning individuals or very young children is that these cognitive constructs that we know about from adults and older kids are not as separable so it's harder to demonstrate discriminant validity. Um, and that doesn't mean your measure is bad. It just means it could mean that, you know, the age group or the level of functioning that you're studying, there just isn't that discrimination. Anything to add, Len, to that? Um, no, I mean, I guess I would, the only other thing I would say is that I, uh, we, we struggled as well, right, to find the right measures um, that were going to be, you know, that we felt comfortable that they they were going to perform adequately so that they provided a nice external validation. I think one of the things that also drove our choice was um, that these were measures, uh, for the most part, that were widely used as well uh, in different populations. And so we felt that clinically, they, they also might be used in clinical trials. And so it would be useful to kind of compare and contrast with ours as well. So that was another reason. Uh, somewhat related, since you had validation, are there still challenges in the measures you use? So if your assessment is correlating with these validation measures, are there still concerns about using those measures in intervention? So in Len's case, the standardized language measures. So what, what are kind of a little bit on the intricacies of, of mm. one or the other? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. I, I, I think um, um, to some extent, you know, our data that will look when we look at kind of longitudinal change and compare kind of effect sizes that will give us a sense of whether our measures are more sensitive to change than the standardized measures. Uh, and if they are great, if they're not, then I think the, then the standardized measures may pre be preferred in some cases. I, you know, but I think it's also that there's kind of, you know, multiple reasons. I think it, you know, has to do with issues like generalizability to real world settings will be important, um, which I think is a limitation of a lot of standardized measures. I think the level of training that one needs is another measure. And I think that's been a real problem in clinical trials in general, because I think it's a source of variability that people have not really appreciated. Um, and so measures that are simpler to administer, I think um, should be preferred, all other things being equal. Um, and I think the expressive language sampling is easy to administer, 
Now, the problem obviously is on the transcription end where that's really time consuming and costly. So I think you know if, if you have a set of measures that are equal, then I think you have to look to other factors in terms of making the ultimate decisions. Anything to add to that, David? No, it sounds right to me, yeah. And then sort of a, a comment that's come in that um, uh, one of the attendees has heard that uh, some of the more standardized measures seem to assess more academic and learning types of things um, instead of true intelligence um, or maybe also sort of skills used in day-to-day -day operations. And that might be a contributing factor, but it seems really difficult to tease apart. Um, another question we have is, are people able to get access to manuals to give more specific information on what you're doing and how you're doing it? Yeah, um, and I can quickly answer that. Um, and if I was ready, I could post it on the chat, I guess. But there is a manual that we developed that's an addendum to the primary toolbox manual that is for intellectual disabilities. And it covers things like, you know, standardizing the kinds of prompts and how many prompts and where you should start with the assessment based on mental age instead of chronological age. Um, and then some scoring issues there. So that is on the NIH toolbox website. And um, yeah, I can, I can certainly like maybe give it as a link to this talk later or people can write to me for it. Yeah, and our um, manuals for administration of conversation and narration, um, I, uh, we have those available if they go to either of the publications or the, the one that I listed for you, Angie. Um, there's a link uh, that you can get the full public, the, the manuals that talk about uh, training of the examiners, uh, the administration itself, and then there are fidelity rubrics for assessing fidelity of administration. Uh, that's all in there and that's freely available. And we hope people will use it. The other thing I will say is that we have, if I've done the math right, we have something like uh, nine, just from that once, from the, the consortium project, we have 900 conversations, 900 uh, narrations and 900 uh, ADASs. Uh, and once they're all fully transcribed, then I think they become a nice standard if people want to look at other ways of analyzing them or deriving language measures and comparing them to kind of our gold standard transcripts, that would be great. Um, that's an awful lot of transcription. And so we'd like to have people make, you know, take advantage of that as well. Thank you. Um, so we've gotten a lot of thank you for your talk. It was a wonderful talk. One other question, this one for Dr. Abadudo. Um, the attendee is wondering about compliance decisions. Is it pretty straightforward for trained administrators to decide and was compliance consistent or did you have variability across um, tasks and time points? So the compliance, um... And I didn't really mention this, but the so um, so judging compliance is not all that straightforward, right? I mean, and you also have to make a judgment if, let's say, in a in a twelve minute task, if the child is kind of disconnected for you know thirty seconds, is that okay or not? And so there is a, there is an element of clinical judgment, um, and for us, it really was based kind of in the decision of the examiner and or the transcriber who could kind of listen and see. Um, but most of our non-compliance were things where it was clear that you, we were just not engaging them or they just lost interest in the task. Um, the, for the individuals with Down syndrome conversation uh, was they were more compliant on average than that than narration. That wasn't quite as true in our, uh, our participants with Fragile X. The conversation narration in terms of like the engagement were pretty equal. Uh, the other thing I will say, though, is that in the psychometric analyses we did that ruled out the non-compliant participants, but did not rule them out based on whether they had shorter durations of their uh, conversations or if they had fewer utterances. It really was based on kind of that clinical judgment of non-compliance. And so even, even uh, participants who kind of had relatively short samples, but they were still judged to be compliant, uh, they, uh, their psychometrics, at least at a group level, were pretty reasonable as well.
The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.